we are right in line for our next uh, talk. Uh, this is by John Athade. I probably mispronounced that. Um, he's going to be talking about how they work no, together was... better. Oh, great. Lean UX, Agile Development, and User-Centered Design. Um, John is a designer and developer who spends a lot of time fighting bad coding practices in the Rails view layer. He's currently VP of Design at CargoSense, a logistics product company. Prior to this, he was the lead UI and UI apps at Living Social. In the past, he's also been the lead designer at InfoEther and ran hyphenated people with Amy Hoy. He's currently setting up a small farm outside of Charlottesville where he can garden and play in the dirt between design and code sessions in his free time. He likes to he plays guitar and keyboards for DC's own Juniper Lane. He co-authored the Rails View with Bruce Williams and he holds his master's in architecture from Catholic University of America. Awesome. All right, I am going to, you can go ahead and take it from here. All right, let's see if I can get the uh, desktop sharing going. That's sometimes a challenge. It did work earlier today, so I know at least, uh, of course, that's the one that's disabled. Yeah. Um, usually it just takes a minute to okay. come back. Yeah. Usually not this long. Go ahead and reload. Yeah, go ahead. It's, it's grayed out for me too, though, so I don't know if that's going to solve it. Um, wow. if it doesn't come back in a minute, we may have to just start a new session. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the session. Everybody, click your links, come back, um, and we'll start over. All right. All right, here we go. Yeah, it looks like it's working now. You want to turn on your video as well, or? Uh, I can try, but it was causing a lot of jumpiness. Do you want me to give it a whirl, and we'll pause it if not? Yeah, that's fine. All right, hold on. All right, I'm going to turn off my audio and video and let you drive from here. All right, yeah, it's just jump in and interrupt if it's too choppy. So, howdy guys, my name is John Athade and the Atlanta Cargo Sense, and today I'm going to be talking about being Lean UX, Agile Development, and User Centered Design going in concert together. I come from the uh, architecture background of a building variety. And yeah, I you're right. It is a little bit choppy. And then yeah. did a lot of work learning in hyper black and white Mac. Um, right, is that any better? Yeah, that's better. Sorry about that. All right. Um, if it 
if it's still bad, I'll go ahead and dial in. Um, so I, I run design development UX shops, um, and I've done work at various financial institutions, and then for two years I was at Living Social. Um, and now I'm at Cargo Sense. I also wrote this book with Bruce Williams, which is now woefully out of date and also out of print. Uh, maybe we will come back and revise it one day. But today we're going to talk about experience. Uh, experience matters, and I want you to think about the last time you had to call a company. Um, we're thinking in dead stop traffic, or getting turned around in a large theme park airport. And that's your experience, and more often than not, that is a design failure because that was a crappy experience. And this goes back, you know, on the computer side, we can really kind of look at the shift that happened in the, in the early 80s. In 1983, you know, this is MS DOS and Mac OS 1, you know, text versus click. How much that changed the experience? Most of us, most of us spend our days kind of split between these two worlds still. Um, thankfully, more on the Unix side than the DOS side, but still the same kind of paradigm. And now we're shifting from, you know, mouse click to the paradigm of touch. So portability and stuff, we're no longer locked down to a device at a desk now where we're interacting with that information everywhere. So when I go ahead and I interact with a piece of data or the application, the surround could be completely different than it was five minutes prior. And that's a whole new thing to think about because your overall experience is affecting what's going on. And I want you to think about experience, not just in like this formal design process, but everything that you do during the day, you're going to notice this stuff. There's a great failure. Somebody got the sticker machine upside down. Hard to read. Or how many times have you gone and tried to work at a ATM machine and you cannot get the sun angle right? It's coming in from behind you. You're holding your arms up. You're trying to move things just so you can read low contrast screen in bright sunlight. One of the more ubiquitous and annoying things you're going to see is things like doors. And this, while it may not seem so, applies directly to locations. When you have to overly label something, there's a design failure. Normally, a handle implies that you're going to pull. A horizontal bar implies push. And this may seem like something small, but doors and door design goes back over 100 years. You know, there's a, this famous Far Side cartoon. But why do external doors open out? And that would be the Iroquois Theater fire in Chicago in 1903. 600 people died because the doors could not be opened when people pushed against them in panic. So we'll come back back to this in a minute. Um, that's something to think about. Like, how is how can these failures be fixed? So let's define some terms here. What is UX? And by UX, we mean user experience. So the term usability is probably the best definition of what gets lumped into UX. And it was created in the early 90s. And at the time, it was a number of vague and subjective attributes of a product known as user-friendly characteristics. And it marked the beginning of an important shift away from the features of the interface and just being focused on that to becoming concerned with the facets of gen as being seen from the human. And so the International Standards Organization, this is ISO 9241, they define it as the effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction with which specified users achieve specified goals in particular environments. A typical ISO kind of thing. You get the basics of it, but let's kind of break this down here. Jake, famous guys on the human-computer interaction side, um, he, he had a good definition of it, and he refers to an attribute of quality that refers to the promptness which with the users can learn something. Efficiency they attain while making use of it. How easy it is for them to remember how to use it. The amount of error prone issues that occur and their satisfaction while they use it. And so this comes back to these five items comes back to it's like an experience of many years. You're building up things over time um, and it's not just your experience with this particular product, but with all products. Uh, and so it's also 
mistakes apply a lot, and we get back to Iroquois theater. Architectural codes really started to come in, into existence in the 20th century, mainly because of things like this fire and the San Francisco earthquake. Uh, and, and before that, it was kind of, you know, you, there were master builders and things were built really strong building codes start to come out of this. Now, if you think about doors, any door in a commercial building will either open or break away, even even sliding doors. So if you go to a, a Harris Teeter or a grocery store or HEB or wherever you are, and you see that sliding door, if you get there too quick and you bump it, it's actually going to open and, and open like on a pivot point. It's uh, It's kind of disturbing. But that's something to think about. You know, how can you plan defensively for that kind of design? So another thing about UX is that people say make it pretty, and that's what UX is. And this is a great disciplines of user experience design thing. It came out of an article from Kicker Studio, but this is a nice visualization of it that's much better than the original one. And you'll notice that computer science down on the bottom left is part of this. We've also got architecture, Shin. we've got communications, we've got marketing, various kinds of engineering, philosophy, science, psychology, so a lot of UX people dabble in numerous items within this brown circle kind of enveloping all these things. Um, and so it's a lot more than just bringing the pretty. So I'm going to define Agile. I'm hoping that 90% of you know what that is, if not all of you, but just so we're all on the same page. Um, this is kind of what a lot of people end up, at least a lot of managers, <laughs> end up saying is Agile. So it's, we're going to try something called Agile, and that was your training. Um, and whenever you get this, it's just kind of, this. no, I don't think so. So the Agile Manifesto, famously these four pairs of items. And it kind of comes down to orienteering. And when I say orienteering, I'm talking about the Boy Scout style, you know, map reading and land navigation. And that is really from getting you to, from point A to point B, along a known or unknown path and often leading along that path. So in orienteering, you find out where you are, you shoot an azimuth and choose a target, you walk to that target along your eventual route and you repeat. So, and every time you get there, you're, you're readjusting to say, how, okay, are we, are we there? Because sometimes you're going to hit obstacles and you have to work around them. Uh, so you're never doing straight line walks. And I think that's a lot very similar to do with agile development. And, you know, this is not just about getting yourself out, getting a group of people there and all acting in concert. So, you know, if you look at Dave Thomas, he had the great thing when he did his Kill Agile talk. Uh, he kind of broke it down similarly with, in Agile, you find out where you are, you take a small step to where, towards your goal, adjust your understanding based on what you've learned, and you repeat. Also said in the lean UX world, a lot of times, or lean startup world, is build, measure, learn. So that's another way people will talk about this kind of thing. And it's not the crazy, you know, measure 40 blues Google story where Doug Bowman quit as creative director, but it's it's about the effectiveness of the design. Uh, does this design set out to do what we think it's going to do? We have a hypothesis. We're going to build it. We're going to test it. We're going to see what our result is. So it's taking the scientific method to design and function. So we're going to look at some processes and methods that we use in user experience design. And a lot of these things tie to the engineering side. It's really hard to separate them purely because choices on one often affect choices on the other. So the first one is waterfall, which is the traditional big deliverable documents and the nightmare of, of, of this kind of flow chart where there's a critical path, and then what happens outside of it? And any delay in your dependencies just destroy everything. It's, you've got tons of people waiting for something. You're losing money. And what ends up happening is formal siloed approach. Define, design, develop, test, deploy. And you know, as we're going, this is just one small part of it, right? But this really is what a lot of agencies and places like that because they're looking at deliverables. You know, I need to provide you with these wireframes, and then I hand off the wireframes, and then I can bill you for the wireframes. Um, and we we did some work at InfoEther where we got something for a very, very large company, and it was a 300-page design document and requirements from a design agency about how this product was supposed to look. Um, 
and you'll hear people go in and say, but, but we're agile, and no, you're not. You're, you're, you know, each team may be trying to work in an agile fashion, but you still end up with handoffs and it's waterfall. Uh, so product talks to customers, hands off the requirements to the design. Design isn't talking to the customers or the users. Develops not talking to the customers or the users. And then you work through the build from the design, and then QA tests it, and then we launch it. But there's not really a cycle of learning and fixing. It's like, okay, that's done, and it's out the door, and we're on to the next thing that came out of product. So in this world, we're talking more that instead of being this kind of like big siloed, here's my wonderful work approach, I'm going to be more as a person coming in to facilitate design and facilitation of that interface and those interactions. So this is a quote from Jeff Gothel, the author of Lean UX, and it's about, you know, instead of looking at that like hero designer or that Johnny Ive kind of character, uh, you go out and basically we're going to say, okay, I'm going to facilitate a, a design experimentation, I'm going to make things happen quickly, we're going to measure it, and we're going to keep churning. So Lean UX gets thrown around a lot. And when we talk about Lean UX, we're going to break it down into three pieces. Uh, design and thinking, the agile process itself, and the Lean startup methodology. So thinking came out of IDEO. And IDEO is a company that does basically product ideation, which is the most awful word ever, but that's how they describe it. So <laughs> instead of what ifing, they go out and talk to customers. They go out and find out what's happening, and they'll make mental models and figure things out about, like, okay, this is a, I'm going to look at how a person interacts with an automobile, and, and how how do they use the phone in a car? Um, how, are, how are they listening to music? How are they texting when they shouldn't be? You know, what are the things that are happening? Now we can start talking about solutions to these problems or these things that exist in that, that world. And you know it's it's a it's a discipline here. So we're using sensibilities and methods to match needs with what's feasible, and then bring that to a business strategy that we can convert product. And build, measure, learn here is on the right, and here's design thinking on the left. So a lot of this stuff is happening long before any code happens at all. And it's one of these things where if you don't if you don't do this stuff up front and, and get this stuff to inform the process, you end up spinning a lot of churn on the right-hand side. Uh, and a lot of times, some of this stuff happens in the mind of a product and it's never shared and it's never collaborated on. And that definitely can cause even more issues because there's not that put it up on the wall and let's, let's break it down and beat up things and, and really kind of the idea before we, you know, is this even something that makes sense before we start typing code? So just the UX process in Lean UX is kind of concept, prototype, internal validation, external validation, and that's where I'm just taking something over saying, hey, what about this? And prototype here doesn't have to be code. This could be a paper prototype. This could be uh, sketches. This could be all sorts of stuff very quickly. Um, and then when we iterate. Now, some of this could be going parallel with build. Some of this is going with, when you're cutting over the product in the first place. But that's what we're looking at. And it's the practice of bringing the true nature of the product to light. So it's not minimum viable product. It's minimum desirable product, maybe, or something along those lines. There's a lot of terms coming out for this. But it's, it's not just what can I ship. It's what, do I, what does somebody actually want to use that actually improves their life? And how do I get that out the door without it becoming feature creep from hell? So some of the tools that we use to help us get there faster, things like personas, and these don't these can be formalized like this one on the left, or it can be literally scribbled on a piece of paper or a whiteboard. Um, and this is one of the first things whenever I go into in to work with somebody, if they don't have these, this is the first thing we do because so often somebody's saying, "Well, we need this feature," and you're like, "Well, who needs it?" And they throw out some random thing, and you don't know any about what that person or that type of person is. And this really quick you've identified, you can prioritize them, and then you can start saying, do they use this feature? Do they use that feature? What's going to make the system better for them? You give them a name so you're not talking about, you know, user 72. And this, you know, give them a picture. It helps it become real. And these should be up on the wall or, you know, very pre prevalent in some kind of whatever online shared system if you guys are distributed. But it's pretty straightforward. It's basically you've got a person's name, you've got some demographic information, 
some behavioral information and needs and goals. And you can you can bring in some other things like frustrations here on the left. Uh, but it's really about you know kind of you're making us kicking a stereotypical user and finding them. And when we did Living Social with this for our customer advocates, uh, we went through and, and broke up. We had five or six different personas for customer support in different levels, different needs. So what did the manager level need? What did the frontline person need? What did the reporting person need? And this was our document that we like. This is one, one of the examples. And so it's pretty, it doesn't have this kind of like visual thing. It can literally be typed up really quick too. Uh, one of the next things you got you guys are going to do is sketch. Stop doing formal omnigraph holes. Stop doing formal, you know, Visio documents and things like that. Get on a whiteboard. Get on a piece of paper. This is something I did for a project I was working on, and this took me maybe 10 minutes to kind of sketch through some flows just to say, are these the steps? Do we have them all here? If I was trying to do this in omnigraph, it would have taken three times as long because you start worrying about, does that arrow look right? This is something that looked from Living Social too, where we were trying to define a block, and we basically took, drew this on the board in a 30-minute meeting where we discussed the feature, and then took a picture and went and built it. There was no Photoshop mockup; they went straight to code. And a lot of times, I'm doing design, and I'm just using architectural trace paper because you can get this great overlay and really quickly iterate on stuff like that. But another way to do these things is what's called crazy eights. Crazy eights are and design charrettes or sketch sessions or whatever, you basically kind of fold the paper so you get eight panels and everybody draws. The programmer draws, the product person draws, the designer draws, everyone sketches things out and it's literally boxes and arrows, blocks, lines, and you talk about, you just talk about the interaction and you, you have like three to five minutes of each thing and then everybody does it again and does it again and very quickly you see things coalesce towards here's a design concept, here's a design direction, or here's a interaction that we all think is really interesting. Now let's, let's go ahead and bake that. Uh, one of the things we used to do a lot, um, we've done it a few different ways, and we kind of figured this out in hindsight, what we were doing. Um, at InfoEther, we would do product kickoffs uh, you know, in an odd way. Basically, I would roll into the room with Rich Kilmer or Chad Fowler or the other developers, and we basically would be doing this at the same time. So I'd be sitting there and starting to scribble on paper kind of possible layout ideas and things like that. At the same time, one of the developers was actually building the, the model objects in Ruby. No controllers, no nothing, just what are the domain models and talking about how they interact with each other. And very, very quickly that stuff's coming out. And we, by the end of a day, we would have a pretty good idea of where this was going and what it was going to take to get it there. And then we could say, is this really important? Is that really important? And we'd also do something where instead of trying to make up a whole lexicon that the customer understood, we taught them our lexicon. We said, a model is this, you know, and, and we explained it. And so instead of having to translate in our heads all day, we just taught them how to speak like we were speaking. And it worked out wonderfully. Uh, Chad actually ended up writing a blog post about that a couple of years back about us doing that. And this comes down to sketch and build simultaneously. It's really effective because the engineers aren't in the dark with what is this going to be on the front end and the design's not in the dark with how is this going to work. Um, so one example, I did some open government work with Waldo Jaquith who now runs the US Open Data Institute. We created Virginia Decoded initially which has now been rolled out as the state decoded by the Open Gov Foundation. But um, this was just early sketches. We were just sitting there talking. And so here I've got these three little micro sketches. They're about an inch in size. And then I took the third one and made it a little bigger. So that's like a three inch square in a, in a moleskin, maybe a four inch. And that, from there, I basically took that and said, okay, now I can have an idea of what I think this is going to look like in my head. And I went to Photoshop and actually branded it out. What are the colors? What are the things that are going to look like? What's the font pick? You know, all these things like that. And that's something that we could take that and then apply it, and it wasn't a, it wasn't an unknown. This wasn't the first time that Waldo saw this. He already knew kind of what the wireframe was. He knew where things were going to lay on the page. So, you know, instead of it being like, oh, well, that's not the right thing for the home page, it was, hey, can we shift the icon? You know, it was the brass tacks at the point. So if you're doing this, so you really can skip a lot of the, like, I don't like that, you know, the entire interaction and really get down to the nitpickiness of, and then you can start throwing, if you really want to do the 40 greens, you can do that, you can do that in code. Um, 
So some of the stuff is trying to figure out the big picture and prototyping. And the first thing is if you don't know your users very well, you need to figure out a mental model. He wrote this great book. Uh, it's from Rosenfeld. But it's, uh, it's I mean, it's kind of old now, but it's, it's definitely very relevant. Um, and what a mental model is, this is a very simple mental model. This is a mental model that talks about a person's morning. So the top has kind of mega tasks broken up smaller tasks, so etc. And then the bottom half of this, they were looking at what consumables does that person use during those tasks? Because that was going to ap apply to their, what they were, where they move forward with this. So on big teams, a lot of this is handled by business analysts or product people, but I think it's one of those things, you get everyone in a room and just a whole bunch of post-it notes, put them up on the board, and you can get really far. And once you have this mental model, you can start applying this to what I call just big picture design. So we have some functionality, maybe it's existing, maybe it's not, and we're going to go ahead and really just kind of like blue sky what's happening. Uh, at Living Social, we took this, uh, we had three apps when we arrived, when InfoEther was acquired, and we basically had started breaking up the monolithic app into a whole bunch of, of services. And so we knew a bunch of things were going to be changing, and we knew that we were moving from shared screens to job-specific screens. So people who were in program deals in the schedule were going to be looking at data in one way, while people who were producing and actually getting the deal from sale to the site live were going to be looking at it in another way. And so what we started to do was come up with some like some blue sky ideas of what you could or couldn't do, just in the sense of trying to say to management, here's the potential. How do, do you guys want to prioritize this? And so we presented this to Aaron Battalion, who was CTO at the time. And Aaron is very quick to tell you what he does and doesn't like. And I was a little frightened because he just kept looking at very quietly back and forth at these drawings. And he finally looked up at me and said, you do realize this is 18 months of work, right? And we did kind of have a guess that it would take a long time to build this stuff. But the concept was just to say, here is where we're going in the future. This is a direction we're going to go. We started building this, of course, things and things move around. But it's a lot of the design decisions made here ended up iterating through. And so some of the stuff, like this is what a scheduling prototype that we ended up building. And this is something we had tried, and we, we didn't have it tied into the back end. So we basically made a JSON fake back end and had the whole interface work with just flat files. And so a lot of this, we started putting this in front of users and managers who were actually going to have to do it on a day-to-day -day basis and say, hey, does this work? Is this, how does this feel based on what you know, what you're trying to do? Uh, and you know, the biggest thing about usability testing is it's kind of awkward. Uh, very often, <laughs> you get somebody being like, sure, that's great, that's wonderful. No, I love it. And they're just lying to you. So some of the stuff we started to use, we used an app called Silverback. Silverback records the screen and the person with the camera. So we did a, a video. Uh, this is one of our shots with Jeannie O'Reilly, who was one of the managers. And we got to go through the whole tool. We asked her a bunch of questions. And we said, hey, what's up? Uh, use this, try this. And one of the most interesting things you're going to see here is how much she's clicking the mouse just as a nurse habit. And she's dragging it and she's highlighting. And you know, what does that do to your interface? Oh, OK. So it's, it's really interesting to start seeing that interaction and how someone starts to explore a new space and a new app. Once we went through all this, you know, we were able to share this with the team. But the great thing about this is we could do this on her computer, at her desk, in her space. And normally, you're sitting there in a formal lab with a camera on somebody that just feels awkward. So, hey, John, you're really hard to understand. What you can also do is use something <clears throat> called full story. Uh, full story is a little more expensive than that, but it, it actually runs on. So what you can do is actually watch real users using your app and, and go in and, and just watch these segments. You can highlight and share them with people. You can talk about them. And I, we used this at a company I was helping consult with. And it's it's awesome because all of a sudden, you know, there's no question. You're actually watching somebody do their daily job in the tool. 
So when you, especially when you have complex workflows and you've got people going around and you can kind of see how do they use it, because someone's going to tell you how they use it, which will be different than how they actually do it when they're not thinking about it. So we had taken all that and we ended up, this is something we did. This was the customer service. It's a two screen app. It's two 19 inch monitors these guys had set up uh, and these, they were tied together. Um, Richard built some some JavaScript stuff to tie these together. I don't recall exactly how it was, but this is where that kind of interface evolved to. And there's a lot of data here. But before this, they had one long page in Salesforce. They were jumping between that and another tab in a Rails app that had some admin information they couldn't get into Salesforce. It was difficult to find things. There was it was hard to annotate things. And for any of you who have used Salesforce, it was a really messy page. And you know that that stuff can get out of hand really quick. So we started, we, we ended up designing and starting to build these screens in the backbone that was going to sit on top of Salesforce, so a separate backbone app. But that was months and months of work. And so what we ended up doing was going and fixing all the pain points that we could while we were building it. So what we're doing right now at Cargo Sense, I'm just calling just in time uh, based off of the logistics thing, one we're a logistics company, so it's kind of funny, and it's also the, you know, there's a little, little bit of tongue in cheek about it with the, uh, most most stores these days have three to five days of merchandise. There is no back of the store anymore, it's the loading dock. Um, and so that's why you have empty shelves every minute, every time snow is forecast, at least in the mid-Atlantic. So there's four steps I kind of have in this approach. The big picture design process, which we talked about, applying that design, codifying it into a living style guide, and we keep revising as we go. So from a timeline perspective, UX joins at some point. Ideally, you join at the impetus of the project before it's you know even started being coded, but often user experience designers drugged in later. So initially, you're going to come in and do a very intense design push, and then you're going to start building and styling. Um, and the goal of this is to kind of stay just a step or two ahead of where engineering is ready to go. This way you don't go design 150 screens and then hand it off and say, okay, now we're going to build this. There are some times where you still need to do that because you're trying to figure out how a product may be reimagined. So I've done that recently where we did go and do actually something like 100 screens because we were trying to reimagine an entire section of a product. Um, and we were actually running people through it as a, a prototype, a clickable image prototype. But uh, at Living Social, the way we did this was a Ruby gem called Wild. So Wild basically codified all of our internal styles and layout files and let every engineer on the internal tools team install it and version it and then be able to use all of these interface elements. This is the default dump, like what you get. You get modals, you get left nav, you get top nav, you get notifications, you get this kind of personal drop down, you get stats on the right, you get the main nest area. And it's a, it was a responsive design, it worked on multiple devices, multiple screens, and it had built in documentation when you were running it in development. So people could just go slash wild as a controller path, and all of a sudden they had all the stuff at their fingertips. Um, and so we, since this was all internal facing too, we didn't really have too much of a concern about that getting out the door. Um, a lot of things we did here, we pulled from various tools that we were using and kind of combined some stuff together. We pulled some items from Bootstrap, so like new notifications and buttons, we kind of pulled some of the best practices from there. We also kind of made some stuff a little tongue in cheek, because when you're doing the same thing over and over again, you know, success is, or you have successfully created item 72 is a kind of a great thank you. So a lot of the managers wanted to be more playful with their success messaging. Um, again, it's internal and it was a bunch of young people, so you can actually have an error that said, oh snap, and it wasn't a problem. <laughs> Button-wise, we went in and we kind of, again, we took kind of the standard bootstrap stuff and then modified it to fit our needs. We also didn't want to do a lot of class, heavy class work in the HTML. We wanted a lot of stuff to live in SCSS, and so we'd have these styles defined and then we'd have semantic names and we'd use extends or things like that in SCSS. Uh, or includes, depending on which, which way we're doing it, to bring that forward. And this got crazy enough that we actually started building stuff. Um, Lynn Wallenstein and a couple of the guys that were doing Apex development 
built this inside Salesforce. So this was an app in Salesforce that, that we designed. This is the mock-up for it, but it looked just like this. So you can do amazing stuff and really kind of keep your interface the same. So now our guys going from sales tools to support tools, it was it felt like it was the same company, it felt the same you were be so some other stuff here is you know a lot of times instead of getting into the big design mock-up thing you go for just quick interactions and especially if you're moving fast having a piece of paper and a designer sitting with you is great because it comes down to little interactions is really where most of our work happens so two different states a finished versus unfinished submit this is a great example of something you know it took me less than five minutes to think about and sketch and scan it in or take a picture with the phone and send it over to the developer and they were able to go ahead and build it and I could come back and then style it or another person could style it. And then this would end up after we did this and this is okay this is a new piece like this is how we're going to show documents now. So then we're going to head and build that into a living style guide. So for us we break things down a little OCD in SCSS files and then do a big merge with the application SCSS. Uh, this lets us get things in certain orders and and it also kind of makes sure that our files don't end up being one, two, three thousand line SCSS files where you're scrolling through looking for something. Uh, and with CargoSense, like I said, just in time, the Mad Dash. Um, CargoSense is a logistics company. We work with off the shelf uh, sensors uh, and basically doing big data analytics. We call it smart data because we're actually kind of taking these big data dumps that a lot of companies do and then telling stories about shipments uh, and it's mainly pharmaceutical focused uh, it's it's desktop mobile um, but we did some initial tests and the first time took a day with the CEO went out and did the actual shipment setup himself with our iPad app and there's there is something from walking in your user shoes that, that just changes the way you look at everything um, you will notice things that become especially with repetitive tasks after an hour of doing it, I'm going to go code and fix this right now because I can't do it anymore. Um, so, for example, with this screen here, you know, the on-off switches are hard to use comparatively to just a, a, a button that changed state when you tapped it. It was a slower interaction. So finding that stuff out, changing it, making it better very quickly, that's the critical stuff. And, you know, so we're taking that data and turning that data into parts of a story. So pressure change, we can tell about takeoff and landing. And we can we can have that stuff messaged to our users. So again, let's let's take this four step, and I'll show you how we do it. So big picture design process started off with some some pretty high fidelity sketches in this regard, but there's still a lot of scribbling. Uh, and from here, we basically said, okay, let's go ahead and, and brand this out. And we took it into Photoshop, chose some fonts, made it work. Now there's different products, and this is the, a, a static storage one. Uh, and then this is actually the, the screenshots from the, the shipment side of things. And it's all shared through a, in this case, we're using a Bower package instead of a Ruby gem because we're doing <clears throat> Ember and Rails and all, and I think there's Erlang in there too somewhere. Um, but so we need something that could easily be shared across multiple backend systems. And a lot of these design decisions also were made by Bruce in a very quick fashion. And Bruce is a great designer, so it's not, in addition to being a, a, a the CTO, so he was able to just kind of say, well, I'm going to make it like this based off what we've already designed. And then we came back and tweaked things as needed. So he's the one that kind of initiated the bullet graph, which is this graph in the up temperature, and it has the overall extent, the main, the main range, and then things like that. And then this applies to our marketing side too. So we're sharing that that shared library here onto the marketing side, and there's overrides, but it, it all works together. And so when we update a color, it's going to change site wide. It's going to change product line wide. So what are the issues with trying to do this? Because a lot of this stuff is really it seems to be by the seat of your pants and off it's. Um, the first issue is design drift. And by design drift, I mean that on the top is kind of where one of our initial designs started, and then the bottom is a customer support app. And so you can see that a lot of things have changed, mostly in regards to white space, the header, and some kind of basic styling options. 
a little bit of uh, the, the blue shifted a little bit. The color of the uh, floating boxes changed a little bit. And a lot of this just comes down to as you're working with something and you're testing something, you realize this doesn't, this doesn't work as well as I thought it would. Uh, or this takes up 100 extra pixels at the top when I don't need to. So being able to version it in a gem lets you apply it forward and somebody can keep it on the old design and then when they have time to come back through and, and fix the front end, they can. But it's important to know that your design will change over time, especially as you tackle new problems. Another issue you have is, well, that's not my problem. That's not my job. Um, a lot of times I'll hear developers shrug their shoulders and say, oh, well, usability is not my problem. That's what we have a design for. And there's a great book by Ed Catmull. Ed Catmull is the president of Pixar and Disney Animation. And this book really, for anybody working in a creative space, this is a great read. Um, and it's, it talks about how everybody is responsible for the success of the product. In their particular case, it's making movies, but they are also a technology company. If you think about Pixar makes RenderMan, which is the one of the industry standard renderers for all CG visual effects. Pretty much half the movies you see out there that have visual effects are using RenderMan, if not more. But if there are pe this is a great quote from him. If there's people that feel they're not free to suggest ideas, it's a bad thing. So you're going to get ideas from unexpected places, and you want to encourage that. So you need to not just in, like be open to it. You need to go out and seek it. You need to find it. And you need to coax ideas out of people and give them a space to do that. So having big team days where you everybody reviews the product and everyone is free to say things, and it's not a defensive thing, Making setting it up where it's, you can only say yes and. You can't say you know, well, you're wrong. It's, you know, things like that really help move these things forward. And you're going to have ideas come from product, from accounting, from engineering, from design, and they're all valuable. And everyone needs to feel responsible for the success of the product. And if you're getting calls about product problems, that's a, de uh, that's a design failure. So your customer support people are going to be critical in this, you know, being able to help you identify these problems. And you want to be open and engaging and pulling those things in as fast as you can. Because otherwise, you're living in a bubble, and you're like, yeah, we're absolutely, and people are writing horrible reviews about it. Uh, another issue is designers are not used to Agile. They just don't. It, it's not something design is used to doing. Design schools and most design shops work in a very formal waterfall fashion. So um, this is from the, the head of ladders.com rolled out a process for, for UX, and this was basically drawn up by his designers hacked on his door and it's uh, all the complaints they had and how they were feeling um, and it's you end up with all sorts of things here you've got no time to actual ideate always on the deadline and even when they come up with a great idea nobody builds it uh, UX feels it can define the best experience but when given the chance to do so it's not built uh, and so then UX starts not caring there's no completion. There's no sense of accomplishment from UX because it's just this constant forward motion. And, and what, did we do anything with that? And a lot of these things come down to saying, OK, well, how do I make sure these problems don't happen? And one that's stupid but really amazing is celebrate releases. So if you're dealing with a main customer facing site, and you do like a push once a day or a push once a week. Um, you know, go ahead and people to come and have a release party on Friday or whatever. It is. Uh, you probably don't want to push on Friday. So Monday, whatever it is. But um, Get the, get the designer to come over and hit the enter key after you've put the command in, you know, and, and make, make it something inclusive. And so it's like, oh, hey, we shipped this. Awesome. Yay us. And the other thing, and this is across the board, make time to dream. I mean, the famous 20% of your time kind of thing to work on things that come from outside of your actual focus at work. It is really important for both design and development. A lot of amazing things came out of people messing around or doing skunk work stuff after hours. Uh, another issue is just PMO and product teams in general. Um, it's difficult to see in the dark. I had a lot of issues with uh, some product managers in my past where they kept things to themselves and because they didn't want to distract you. And in doing so, this is kind of what it ended up being. We're going to build this complex thing and we're going to wing it. 
Uh, and I don't want you to focus, or I want you to focus, so I'm going to tell you about only about this Sprint's functionality, so I, you're not going to know where we're going to end up. And the biggest lie in software development, we're not going to tackle that until phase two, which is a very nice way of saying, just shut up. And so this is where you end up. You you don't know nobody knows where they're going, so you just kind of end up wandering in this like for 40 years, like the Israelites. And instead of shipping software, everyone's the product person is trying to maintain control. And you just got to break that. It's got to be a collaborative effort, you know, because if, if the team knows where everyone's going and where we're supposed to be going, very easy to start seeing why are we working on this particular ticket? It doesn't get us near or close to that. It actually takes us from there. Does it give us support to get to the next step? And so you can, as a team, start saying, why are we doing this? How are we doing this? What's the best way to do this and move forward? Uh, another issue is forgetting the users. And it's very easy to do this, especially if you don't have a formalized or a regular kind of um, user testing search thing happening. Um, when you use an app all day, it, it becomes second nature to you. It's in yoga, there's a thing saying basically have a beginner's mind. And it's very difficult to do. Um, but often, if you think about so the first time you've opened up some apps, you may be like, uh, what, what is that? Um, and when you shadow users a lot, you, you see these things pretty quickly. And so you don't end up with this offensive part of the app that you've ever visited suddenly making you go, dear God, what is that? And when you have a lot of these things, you end up in the great, great rewrite. So Chad Fowler talks about this. Um, this is something that big rewrites are basically these, we're going to rewrite the app from scratch and you end up most often feeling horribly. Um, no one has a good estimate of the time involved, and you end up, everybody's unhappy, the project never ships, the customers still don't have the functions they've been clamoring for, and it's it's just a mess. And so at this point, this is where we really want to say, okay, how do we do these fixes to the public side and keep moving forward so the customer knows we're listening, and that could be an internal or an external customer, while at the same time moving towards a new product. And so if you modify that, we talk about like existing design fixes. So in doing your customer research, you're identifying a whole bunch of pain points. Some of those are too big to solve within, you know, a day or two. But some of those are really quick. They, it's a design and a developer working for four hours. And that's from impetus to shipping. And one of those examples in the customer service app, this was a mock-up we had done, and newsletter subscriptions was a big pain point. The system was hard to understand if someone was or was not subscribed. It was a button, and the, the name on the, the title on the button changed depending on if they were subscribed or not. But it, um, and so we basically, when they saw this as a mock-up, they asked if they could get that immediately, and we built it out and, and shipped it into the existing admin Rails app, and it immediately sped up their workflow and helped people quickly do things. They also couldn't unsubscribe somebody from everything. So they get a phone call and he's like, I don't want any more emails. And while that's a bummer, you want people to be like, okay. Uh, and the guy's sitting there hitting unsubscribe and somebody had somehow inadvertently subscribed to, you know, seven different cities, 14 different lists on each city, and they're going clicking every single button manually. There was no unsubscribe all fun. Easy thing to add. Boom, done, shipped. Everyone was happy. And so in doing that, you know, we involved the subject matter expert. We got a customer service piece. Um, every phone call to customer service, like I said, is a UX issue. It's somehow an experience issue. And the call itself could be a good or bad experience on top of that. So if you can reduce call volume, that is one of the biggest, in a good way, to our company overhead. So it's, you know, if the more customer support calls you get, the more people you need in the call center. The more people in the call center is, is a real estate cost, it's person cost, it's unhappy customers if they're on. All that stuff comes in. So bring those people in and figure out what's going on. Um, it comes to the point that user testing is hard. It's difficult. It's not fun. Um, and so there's a couple, couple ways to get around it. One is called Gorilla. Uh, gorilla user testing is literally walking up to somebody in Starbucks and saying, hey, what do you think about this? Um, if you're not extroverted, this could be unnerving and painful. <laughs> I've done it once or twice, and I just, you always feel awkward. When, and so for like the first five minutes, you're like, eh. 
But it's it's about trying to get open questions. Um, often I've seen UX tests where people ask very specific questions, expecting because of the way the question was framed. So some open questions, and there's a lot of article link here, but um, it's like, what do you make of this? What do you think you should do here? Uh, how would you do that? And and never say click on blah, because the minute you say click on blah, then somebody is in a hunt and peck situation, and they they're in a people pleasing mentality. They don't realize it, but they want to succeed at the task you've given them. So you want to make sure that it's safe to fail, because that's how you are going to learn what's not working. Uh, and it's now become the the thing, multiple devices, how does this run phone, is it responsive? So you have to make time for this. Um, it, a lot of times this gets relegated down to, you know, post ship or, you know, we barely got it out the door and I got to go fix the, you know, bug on here. But if you build it right from the beginning to be flexible, you don't have to worry about it. Now, I mean, this is just the Samsung devices as of two years ago, just the Galaxy product sizes. So I don't have, I have one of these, I'm not going to go out and base the test. I can try them out in the Chrome DevTools, but it's not exactly the same because you're talking physical device size versus pixel resolution. So you need to build something from the get-go that's going to be a flexible design. And thinking about these things from the start saves you a lot of headache as you get towards the end. Because if you get to the end and you're ready to ship and then somebody says, well, how does this look on, on this obscure tablet device? And no one's thought about it you're going to end up either delaying or you're going to ship something that may not work for somebody. All right, so with that world tour of issues and problems and possible ways to work on these things, what do we do? So this is my admonition to you. I want you guys to gear up. And gear here is very simple. You're going to raid the, uh, the closet and you're going to get some office supplies. You're going to get paper, pencils, pens, paper, you're going to get a whiteboard, you're going to get your phone, which is in your pocket most of the time, and you're going to break open your text editor. You're going to think that Agile is dead, but you're going to think about working with agility. Dave Thomas has this great blog post from last year that I can't reference more. You really should go read it if you haven't. You're going to measure everything you possibly can. If you don't know how people are using something, when you ship a new design, you will not know if it's improved or gotten worse. Now. Uh, that being said, A-B testing can also be your downfall. So it's it's measure, but I mean it's, it's good to have the data, but don't live or die by the data. Love your users. If your users are unnamed people somewhere out in the world, you're not going to be able to care for them. You need to make them real. You need to go visit them. You need to make personas, whatever you can do to personalize that and get the team all on the same page about it. You want to secure quick wins. Whenever you find a quick little problem, go ahead, grab a developer, make time for this, make it a, a Friday that you only fix issues in the system since you're not going to be, you shouldn't be pushing big code fixes over the weekend anyway. Just go ahead and make a bunch of fixes on Friday that rolled out on Monday. Um, whatever you have to do in your organization, make time to do quick wins and quick fixes that are outside of the normal ticket flow. Get rid of silos. If your design team sits over pontificating, sipping lattes, and you know wearing cool hipster glasses, break that up. Go ahead and get everybody sitting together. Your every this stuff is changing so fast now that you know a front end engineer and an interaction designer, one guy's got to be working in in origami or After Effects and showing that to somebody else, and she's going to be building that in 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 Ruby, and then this other person's got to test that, and and the researchers coming in saying, hey, we tried this and it didn't work. And if everyone's sitting in separate areas and is not collaborating on the product together, that information takes a long time to percolate. And while I've got QA listed here, everyone should be doing QA. Everyone should also be caring about the interaction and the experience. An engineer should not feel that they can't say, that flow sucks. And it shouldn't be like, well, you're an engineer, you don't know what you're talking about. And they'll be like, no, that sucks. It's slow. It's boring. It's a better one that I found in this other app. I like this. Can we kind of learn from this? Go with that. Get everybody into GitHub or whatever kind of system you're doing and do a pull request flow. We started doing this at Living Social. Uh, Bruce kind of came up with the concept uh, from what I remember. And um, basically, we'd open empty pull requests. We'd start talking, start typing, a discussion, and then we're pushing code on the pull request as it was completed. Design files would go up in that pull request as they were completed. 
So we had one long thread that we could then sit there and look back at the story of that feature or that concept and see how it worked. As you're building design problems, in, especially across multiple apps or in big apps, you're going to create solutions, and that should kind of go into a kit of parts. Um, and so in the future, when you approach a similar problem, especially if it's in a shared family of apps, you're not reinventing the wheel and having two different interactions for the same kind of thing. Developers need to learn some basics of UX. You know, go read Defensive Design for the Web. It's now over 10 years old, but it's the, one of the UX books from 37 Signals, but everything in it still rings true. Um, pretty much anything Steve Krug wrote is great. Um, if you get deeper, you can go read Jacob Nielsen or, or things like that, but start at least getting these ideas into your head. Um, there's a lot of great books at, at Rosenfeld Media, too, on the UX side of things. And get your designers code. They don't need, I know there's a lot of people getting bent out of shape lately saying designers don't have to code. If, as an architect or somebody who went to architecture school, if I try to design a building having not studied and looked at how buildings were created, I'd make really crappy buildings. So you need to understand, even if you don't write the code yourself, as a designer, you need to understand how this is going to be built. And the best way to do that is at least learn HTML and CSS. At least learn some of the basics of do a, do the 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 Prague Studio you know Intro to Rails class or something like that. Designers that are that are at least thinking about this kind of thing. If they want to get heavy into it, it's awesome if they can be doing the prototype and the front end work while you're doing the back end work. But at least get them to understand the basics. And finally, forgive. Um, and and patch it called the getaway car, uh, which is actually her memoir about uh, being an author. Um, but she really captures kind of how imposter syndrome can really de destroy us from a perspective. And I think this applies both to designers and programmers. And she talks about the ability to forgive oneself. Uh, and I'm going to read real quick this quote. But stop here for a few breaths and think about this, because it is the key to making art and very possibly the key to finding any semblance in life. Every time I have set out to translate the book or story or hopelessly long essay that exists in such brilliant detail on the big screen of my limbic system onto a piece of paper, I grieve for my own lack of talent and intelligence every single time. Were I smarter, more gifted, I could pin down a closer facsimile of the wonders I see. I believe that more than anything else, the grief constantly having to face down our own inadequacies is what keeps people from being writers. Forgiveness, therefore, is key. I can't write the book I want to write, but I can and will write the book I'm capable of writing. And again and again, through the course of my life, I will forgive myself. So with that, build the app that you can build today. Pick up a piece of paper and sketch some interactions, even if you've never done it before. Go ahead and talk and have conversations about how things work. Figure out what you can do as a group. Find those, those weak spots and train them. Find the strengths and utilize them. And, you know, we're constantly learning. I mean, I don't think any of us, you know, 10, 10 years ago could, t could say that we would be working in Rails. Maybe a few of us had already started. I, I didn't start in it until 2006. So, you know, we're constantly learning new things. And so build what you can build, learn what you can learn, and go out there and climb the mountain. And I guess we'll go ahead and do questions, see what uh, questions and comments here. Uh, where is that? All right, let's see. Uh, yeah, Charles, Charles, definitely the pile of PSDs and then being like, oh, we didn't use it because that happened. The 37 signals, yes, yeah, is, is um, defensive design for the web. Uh, I do use Basalmic Mockup. Um, I have used it less and less when I sketch more and more. <laughs> um, Basalmic is good, especially in distributed situations, um, because you can have that. It, it's a sketch, and people stop worrying about this is two pixels off or this doesn't line up. So if um, if that tool works for you, it's a great tool to use. Um, I, I personally have spent so many years 
drawing on architectural trusts that it's a hard habit to break. And hand drawing, I think, is just faster. And Thomas makes, I mean, Thomas makes a good point. It's like, it's not about drawing fancy. It's literally scribbling. I mean, uh, make with fat markers so nobody can really make nice detailed things. Get fat Sharpies or, or do it on a whiteboard. No one's going to draw really well on a whiteboard. Paper design workflows like Crazy Eights. There's, um, there's a variety of articles out there. I don't have something off the top. Basically, if you... Um, the basic concept is you you sit down and you say you have three minutes and we're gonna you give a design brief you know we're gonna talk about this interaction or this page here's the basics of it three minutes to sketch and, and people can sketch anything about it and then you you each present and then you do another round and another round and so the eight panels is kind of a when you you're stepping through a flow it's really great for mobile uh, because because they the they end up being about the size of the the 4s screen. Or the 5s screen, maybe. The um, you can also just do like you can draw four boxes on a page and, and photocopy it and work that way. Too. Um, breaking down silos, you have to get upper management's buy-in. Uh, that or you just have to become a Skunk Works organization. You can if 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 management is digging in their heels. You basically have to just make things happen, <laughs> and it's frustrating. You've got a way to get a conversation going and run, run, chat back and forth or, or back channel stuff. It's the biggest thing is getting management buy-in, and a lot of that. Sometimes you need a UX champion in an organization that can come in and say, "Here's how to do it," and and, and it's stupid because often it's like you feel like you're bringing in the Bob. And it gets you know management's like, "Oh, that's great, great, yeah, that's wonderful." And it's everything that everyone has been saying, but because they're paying a consultant the money, they believe it. I've been there both as the consultant and as the employee watching the consultant say what I said. Right. <laughs> All right. Any other questions before we uh, wrap this up? Wrap this up. I always jump the gun and then somebody's like, wait. All right. Looks like we're uh, we're done. You can, Thank uh, you, John. You're welcome. All right. Well, um, we have a half hour break. So um, go enjoy some food or some downtime, and we'll be back at 2.30.